Hey folks, so I have a confession to make. For the last year or so, I've been seeing another machine. Towards the end of 2019, and just before the planet became a plague-infested hellscape, I ordered a Glowforge laser cutter. Now before anybody panics, I'm not switching away from CNC, but I am enjoying splitting my time between the two and often combining both machines to make cool things. One thing I've noticed is on the forums for both Shapoko and Glowforge, each platform has a certain curiosity about the other platform, its problems or its benefits. Since I'm in a comfortable long-term relationship with both, I figured I might as well share my experiences and maybe demystify any misconceptions about the two machines. To start with, there are a number of basic similarities between the two. Both machines use a set of parallel rails on either side with belts that are used to move a central rail back and forth. The center rail has a cutter that moves from left to right using a similar belt and motor system. In the case of CNC, this cutter is a router, and in the case of Glowforge, it's a laser. In terms of setting up a workspace for the machines, both the Shapeoko and the Glowforge require some venting options. In the case of CNC, you'll need a vacuum system of some kind to deal with chips and dust that are created by the router. This can be as small as a standard shop vac or a more heavy duty option like this full size dust collector. With the laser, there is no dust, but there is smoke, which can be vented out of a nearby window using the built-in exhaust fan. There's also an optional filter system. However, the filter system tends to be a bit pricey and the filters themselves have to be replaced on a regular basis. In terms of workflow, both machines, for the most part, use one program for design and a second one to send the actual commands to the machine for cutting. The Shapeoko uses Carbide Create to design and Carbide Motion to drive the machine. The Glowforge uses vector software like Inkscape, Illustrator, and Infinity Designer to create SVG files that can be uploaded to the Glowforge web app for cutting. Glowforge has begun to offer some limited design options in the web app, and they're continuing to expand these. However, it is an extra subscription cost, and most folks seem to do their designing in one of the programs I mentioned. Interestingly enough, though, software like Inkscape, Illustrator, or Infinity Designer will all export to an SVG file. This is a format which Carbide Create supports and can import which means Shapeoko folks can also design in these programs. In fact, Inkscape has become my editor of choice for both machines. With the Shapeoko, once you have your design in place, you use the toolpath section to tell it what kinds of cuts to do with which lines. V-carve, inside cut, outside cut, trace, and more. In a similar fashion, you choose the type of cuts in the Glowforge web app for things like cutting, scoring, and engraving. So in mechanical and project flow terms, there's a lot of similarity between using the two machines. Create a design, define the cuts for the design, send the design to the machine, and press go. All of that said, these are two very different machines, and it's really obvious from the moment you receive them. The Shapeoko, arrives as a collection of parts in boxes and has to be assembled. This can be a little intimidating at first, but it's really not that bad if you follow along with the instructions and ask questions when you get stuck. The Shapeoko is also a very industrial looking machine by design and rightfully prides itself on strength and rigidity. On the other hand, the Glowforge arrives almost entirely assembled and looking like something out of the Apple School of Design. As a pre-assembled unit, this critter is also incredibly heavy, so you might want two people to get it out of the box and onto a table. Speaking of the box, you'll want to keep it and all of its packing material. 
This is because in the event of repairs, you'll need to ship the unit back to Glowforge, and the box is the only way to pack it effectively for shipping. Glowforge will happily sell you a new shipping box for $200 at last check, so hang on to your original shipping box or weep the tears of regret. This setup philosophy is the first of the trade-offs between the two machines. On the Shape Oko, you assemble it, and in theory, if you know how it all goes together, you can usually see when things go wrong and order a replacement part from Carbide 3D. If the router dies, you replace it. If a belt breaks, ditto. Even if you release the magic blue smoke from the controller board, you just order a new one and put it in just like you did the last one. The Glowforge requires no assembly, which is a huge plus for a lot of users. However, while the company does offer some limited replacement parts, a laser is a pretty complex thing, and it's unlikely you'll be diagnosing and fixing it on your own. So, rebox and ship is really your only option in some cases. I've had to do it once, and it was less than fun. That said, it got fixed, and it works fine now. While the setup may seem a bit daunting to some, I think I give the Shapeoko the nod in terms of setup strictly from a long-term maintenance standpoint. When you build the machine, it's just easier to see what goes wrong with it. And the Glowforge can be a little bit of a black box in terms of diagnosing issues. So, points to Shapeoko on this one. Once you have things set up, it's time to make your first project. The Shapeoko starts you out with its version of Hello World, which is using a Sharpie zip-tied to the front of the router to draw the Shapeoko logo on some paper. While this is a fun little startup project, it really doesn't teach you anything about the bits and the cut settings you're actually going to use on a daily basis. And I would love to see Carbide 3D take some cues from Glowforge here. Glowforge includes a starter pack of materials with the machine, and offers a series of first projects to show you how to use them. The designs work their way from simple to more detailed projects and give you a much better idea of what the machine is capable of and how to actually use it. The materials are another big difference between the two machines. The Shapeoko is a beefy beast and happy to cut various thicknesses of metal, wood, plastic, the thickness of the material is only limited by the length of your cutting bit and the maximum height of your router. There's even ways to mount pieces on the very front of the machine and cut even longer materials. The Glowforge has a focus range of about a half an inch, which means this is as tall as your material can be without removing the crumb tray. With the tray out, you can actually engrave on thicker pieces up to about two inches. However, the Glowforge can only effectively cut things like wood and acrylic, up to about a quarter of an inch or so. You can cut thicker material with multiple passes, but the cut quality will degrade significantly. Additionally, the Glowforge will not cut metal at all, and will only etch it with the use of chemicals like Surmark. On the flip side, in addition to thin wood and acrylic, the Glowforge will happily cut or etch paper, leather, cloth, even chocolate if that's what you're into. Lots of things can be cut in the Glowforge, and the only thing to keep in mind is that cutting equals burning. And some things react very poorly to being burned. Take for example sheet PVC, which is a popular choice in the Shape Oko community. Burning PVC creates gases that will destroy the Glowforge laser's lens, not to mention doing some truly terrible things to your lungs. This is one of the reasons why you'll see a lot of references to MSDS, or Material Safety Data Sheets, in the Glowforge forum. These sheets will tell you what can safely be burned and what cannot. <laughs> One of the other things that Glowforge has done in the area of materials is to sell what it calls proof-grade materials on their website. These materials are manufactured specifically for Glowforge to their specification. There are QR codes on each of the proof grade materials, which get scanned by the Glowforge to determine what kind of material is being used and what the proper settings are for cutting, scoring, and engraving. Which brings us to another big difference between the two machines, the Glowforge camera. On the Shapeoko, in order to tell the machine where to cut, 
We position our material on the waste board. We then move the bit to a specific spot on the material. We set that position as zero and it tells the machine where our material is and where to make the cuts. The Glowforge has a camera embedded in the lid. When the lid is closed, the camera takes a picture of the material you place in the machine. If the material is proof grade, it'll handle all the settings automatically. Otherwise, it will scan and try to determine a focus height for your material. You'll need to manually enter in the settings for any non-proof grade materials, but you can use the built-in settings as a starting point. Additionally, once the camera does its initial scan, an image of the Glowforge tray appears in the interface, and you can drag your design over the material and position it for cutting. The camera is reasonably accurate for most work, but because it's mounted fairly close to the top of where your material sits, it uses a fisheye focus to see the entire tray. This can lead to some distortion at the edges. For better alignment, most people tend to use jigs made of cardboard to hold the workpiece in the proper position. These are the kind of tips and tricks you'll learn as you go along with either machine. So let's talk a little bit about the learning curve. Both machines are going to require you to learn some new software. You'll need to learn how to draw out the designs you need with a computer program. Carbide Create has become a pretty robust package for design on the Shape Oco, and since you have to use it for setting the tool paths, it's really your best option for the Shape Oco. For Glowforge, the web-based editor is okay for basic shapes, but currently lacks any of the features you would need for any true design flexibility. I would recommend Inkscape since it's free, and there are a number of great tutorials here on YouTube. If you plan on using both, Inkscape is a really great way to go. Both platforms also have very good forums for asking questions. I would always start out by reading posts and searching for answers to your questions. If you can't find the answer you need, then ask. Without fail, the most common question in either forum is something like, what settings do you use for this or that material? You'll see this as things like feeds and speeds on the Shape Oco forum, sometimes zips and pews on the Glowforge forum. The answer to both is always the same. Search for the material you're working on on the forum, and see what settings that person used. While this can seem a little dismissive, it's really because the settings in each case will vary due to any number of factors. The only real way to figure things out is to test. Both the Shape Oco and the Glowforge have default settings for a variety of materials. Start with those and make adjustments as needed. If you don't see your exact material listed, go with something close and make a small test. Try a few different settings and see what works best for you. Keep a notebook or a spreadsheet with your favorite settings and you'll have something to refer back to. The bottom line is don't be afraid to test or to try things. Failure is allowed and even expected. I have had some pretty spectacular failures and they always make for great stories. If I'm pressed to say which of the two machines is easier to learn, I would probably say Glowforge. But that's strictly due to the fact that Glowforge only has a single cutter. It cuts straight down and at one width. This limits the number of factors a new user has to account for. The Shape Oco has a ton of options. V-bits, straight bits, rounded bits, drag bits, a variety of specialty bits. The cuts are more flexible, but that also brings a certain level of complexity. And if you're not familiar with router bits in general, this can lead to some confusion. So which machine is, quote unquote, better? That depends on what you're making. For smaller projects, using thin materials, the Glowforge is the way to go. It's quicker and less likely to break small, fiddly parts than a spinning router bit. For larger projects or metalworking, the Shape Oco is hands down the tool of choice. Also for things like furniture, you can get a bed size of up to 33 inches square and a milling height of 4 inches. The Shape Oka really just cannot be beat in terms of price and quality for that kind of work. For materials like leather, fabric, and paper, the Glowforge is your buddy. I would also give it the nod for things like acrylic, since the Glowforge leaves behind a flame-polished edge, which is really hard to beat. For cut variety, the Shape Oko has a wide variety of options. 
As I've said before, I love the V-bit. Being able to cut mitered corners for cubes and boxes is one of my favorite things in the world. For precision, the Glowforge is an amazing machine. I've been using it recently to create works of art by removing layers of paint on canvas and boxes. The control and speed is giving me some truly amazing results. From my personal perspective though, I want both. So many of my projects now use both machines that I can't imagine having just one. Take these two TARDIS builds, for example. The larger one was cut out on CNC, but the police signs and the flashing top light were made on the Glowforge. In the smaller version, all of the tiny wooden plastic pieces were cut out on the Glowforge, but the internal electronics use a PCB board that I etched on the Shape Oko. The bottom line for me is that if either machine broke tomorrow, I would quickly replace them, as they're becoming essential to my creativity and workflow. I really don't think you can go wrong with either machine. Just decide what you want to create and decide which fits it best. Then join the community and start reading and watching. You'll get the hang of it, and I hope you share some of what you create with the rest of us. Until next time, have fun and take some chances. And please get off my machine, chunky boy.